Thank you very much, uh, Rul, for this kind uh, introduction. Oh, I have to stand here. Okay, very good. So, um, so when uh, Rul contacted me a few weeks ago to uh, to give a talk on uh, on bell inequalities. Um, I wasn't, uh, of course I had to do this, but I was not really amused because bell inequalities are the main reason that quantum mechanics is completely incomprehensible, that it's the main reason that 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 people think quantum mechanics is spooky, is, is all the popularizing talks on quantum mechanics say that bell inequalities is the is the biggest discovery and make it impossible to understand. So it's basically the, the, the I think it's doing a disservice to quantum physics because actually people understand quantum physics in the sense that you can work with it. We can actually all technologies in the world, many, many technologies in the world are based on quantum mechanics. Transistors would not have been kind of uh, uh, discovered without understanding band structures, which is pure uh, quantum mechanics. So so it's basically um, this 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 whole bell inequality is is the thing that that makes this whole field of quantum feel like it's 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 philosophy it's not really kind of about real science uh, but nevertheless what these bell inequalities did uh, is is uh, is is force people to rethink uh, the foundations of, of quantum mechanics and uh, and by doing this uh, and actually completely new insights in quantum mechanics have been found that have now kind of uh, that start to get lots and lots of applications so uh, um, Basically, my, an overview of my talk, I will kind of start with the historical development because I think to appreciate what bell inequalities are and, and especially also what they mean, you, you need to have a little bit of, of, of the, the story of how quantum mechanics uh, uh, arose uh, and, and, and emerged. Uh, then, of course, there's this famous Einstein Podolsky Rosen uh, kind of paper that started the whole kind of, of business of, of trying to, to, to say that quantum mechanics is weird. It's, maybe it works, but we don't understand anything. Uh, I will briefly talk about Bohm, Bell, uh, and then the experimental validation, and then applications of uh, entanglement. So, so to make sure the, the, the Nobel Prize of, of physics of this year should have been given to John Bell. John Bell is the one that uh, really discovered as a theoretician that in his free time was thinking about foundations. And at that time that he was doing in the 60s, this was like uh, people said, if you think about foundations, this is the end of your career. But he nevertheless did this. And uh, uh, he discovered this in his free time. And this was really kind of a very ingenious kind of insight. And it's very subtle. It's difficult to understand. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I will not be able to kind of do justice uh, to what he kind of did. But I will try at least my best to, uh, to, to make this understandable. So, so, but of course, he died quite some time ago. And that's uh, why the Nobel Prize was given to the people that uh, made the experimental verification of uh, the uh, of these kind of predictions that Bell uh, made. Uh, Sorry for a small interrupt. I forgot to mention one thing, practical thing. Uh, yesterday there was a big electricity failure here on campus, as a result of which we can't control the lighting here. It doesn't work. And, and worse than that, as a result of which the ventilation in this room doesn't work. It's already fairly warm. <laughs> it will only get warmer, I guess. Sorry for that. Nothing we can do about it. Um, yes. Okay. So let's uh, let's start with the historical development. So of course, any um, any story of quantum physics has to start with Max Planck. Max Planck wanted to understand black body radiation. It was like a mystery. There's several mysteries there. So so purely classical electromagnetics. If you kind of take Maxwell's equations, this this kind of predicts that the the the, the energy of the radiation in the black box would go to infinity. Uh, actually, the whole the the shape of your kind of so of your spectrum that comes out of a black body is 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 completely kind of in violation with what you see experimentally. And what he kind of did is, is just a mathematical trick. He said, ah, let me assume that somehow the electromagnetic waves or modes in my systems are in one or the other way quantized. OK, so, so it's still like pure electromagnetism at Maxwell. But let me assume that uh, that the energy of my waves comes as multiples of h times somehow my uh, uh, my frequency and of course the n is just a multiple and suddenly by by making this this simple ansatz he was able to to completely fit the data to somehow well he then he applied just just normal boltzmann statistical mechanics to this 
this to this to this gas of photons that he has now, and then he was able to understand basically the full black body radiation and also the fact that there's not infinite an infinite amount of radiation and so further. But this was for him still just purely a mathematical trick. The real revolution started actually of quantum mechanics started in uh, 1905, and uh, Einstein really called this his most revolutionary idea. So he's from his point of view the theory of relativity and all this was something that was there to be discovered, and if he would not have done it, somebody else would have done it. But from his point of view, his revolutionary idea was really kind of the the wait, wait I'm pushing the. the wrong. Here, uh, it's, it was really kind of trying to say or to, to 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 claim that light consists of particles. That that light is actually both has um, um, a particle and a wave type uh, of um, nature. And uh, this was so certainly people like Planck completely disagreed with this. They never kind of could buy what Einstein did. From their point of view, this was not this was this this this, this was a crazy idea. And uh, but what Einstein could predict with this is, for example, that the time it takes uh, for photoelectrons to be ejected from a metal surface was completely independent of the of the of of, of, of the intensity of light that would kind of, of of fall onto this. And this so this was basically mainly the the the, the main kind of insight that told him. Photons are really kind of, of particles, and 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 you don't need electrons. Don't have to kind of of of, of take a little bit of energy of the electromagnetic field, and if it's, they have enough, they will be ejected. No, they were ejected immediately uh, after somehow they uh, uh, absorbed uh, a photon. And um, uh, and of course, actually, and, and at a later time, the, the, this is exactly also the, the 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 insight for which he got uh, the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, uh, like like almost 20 years, a bit less than 20 years later. Uh, uh, the whole story there is very is very complicated. Why he got it for this and not for relativity theory? Actually, the the reason that he didn't get the Nobel Prize for relativity is that he was uh, he was Jewish and there was lots of anti-Semitism and people kind of were all writing letters to the Nobel Committee that he, that that the, the theory of relativity was wrong. And, but he was so much insurmountable. He was like the most famous physicist ever. If you would land with a boat in America, there would be like 800 girls singing for him there on uh, when he landed there. So he was like the most. He was like the most, the biggest celebrity of all time, basically. So they had to give the Nobel Prize, and then they gave it to this because somehow nobody thought that he would get it for this. So uh, so it's kind of funny. Nevertheless, this was his most revolutionary idea. From his words. Okay, so um, so then it took uh, a few more years uh, for people to absorb this and and this 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 wave and the particles and then especially Niels Bohr uh, was a very kind of smart theoretical physicist. He realized that that somehow if light consists out of of particles. Um, and, and light is absorbed by electrons, then there's something, there's something missing there. There's something incompatible. This actually implies that also uh, uh, electrons must kind of form some, uh, must have some wave character. Okay, these electrons uh, that, 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 that surround an atom must also be quantized because that's the only way in which you can kind of make uh, this whole thing compatible. But again, very similar to what uh, uh, to what Planck did, this was just a mathematical trick for him. The, the an electron was still something that would kind of travel on a certain kind of uh, uh, on, on, on these uh, on these different things, but the electron was still a point particle that would really kind of go around uh, the atom. Okay, so he did not really he did not dare to take the step uh, to say that electrons are again kind of also. Uh, particles and waves at the same time. Okay, this so this step was taken by de Broglie, uh, again ten years later, uh, a French, a famous French physicist who was actually a prince, uh, and he really kind of take the bold step to say that actually. Uh, if you want this all to be kind of, 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 of compatible with each other, also electrons have to kind of have a wave character. Not just electrons, but actually also kind of any kind of particle. What I have? Yeah, it seems that. Okay, like this. Yeah, sorry, I'm. Uh, um, so, so, so what the Broglie said is that. Uh, electrons have a wave character, okay? And this is uh, he made this, this. Of course, immediately kind of made predictions with this. The fact, for example, that that if electrons are also waves, uh, that means that you should see interference effects, okay? And uh, it's a bit subtle to see interference effects. This was then done actually not that much later. I think in 1928 there were like lots of experiments. You must be sure that somehow that you have like two slits and that these two slits are closer to each other than the Broglie wavelength. So, so very important concepts in in all of quantum physics. 
is exactly somehow the size of this wave that you can associate to a particle. Okay, so, uh, um, so, so basically, he says that to any particle, okay, I can associate some momentum, and I have to the 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 way how much I can localize this particle. This is equivalent to having the wavelength of this uh, of this particle is basically proportional to h divided by mv. Okay, and uh, so that means that that uh, for a particle in the equilibrium, if you kind of take some statistical mechanics and then you say what is the average momentum? Well, this is probably just the square root of m times k times t, where you have here the Boltzmann constant. So it means that if you want to have like particles with a large wavelength, then you need either to have basically some small mass, some small temperature, or very high densities. Okay, because somehow what to every particle you can associate some wave character, so we cannot really localize it. And whenever the distance between two particles is smaller than uh, the typical distance, the average distance between two particles is smaller than this, uh, this de Broglie wavelength, then obviously these wave functions will start to overlap and quantum mechanics will be important. Okay, and this is the way to understand still for what systems do we have to kind of use quantum mechanics for which one not. Uh, you kind of have to uh, take this formula for granted. And then, so that means that actually by looking at this formula, it's immediately clear to for what systems quantum mechanics will be relevant. Okay, so you want to, uh, so you can to go back here, uh, you want this, 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 this wavelength to be as large as possible. Okay, so this H, so that means mass small, temperature small, or density very high. And indeed, this is exactly the way where quantum character is emphasized. It's either having by very light mass, and of course, that's why photons are in some sense always already kind of, of, of quantum mechanical. Okay, they have, of course, mass zero, so the wavelength is always a very, the, the, the Broglie wavelength is very large, but also electrons. Electrons are very light, and if you want to understand a metal, there's no way you can understand anything of a metal without using quantum mechanics, because actually the mass is very small. Okay, another kind of option is to have a very low temperature, uh, because then actually the wave character, well, then, then somehow this T is very small, so the particles kind of start overlapping, and this is exactly what kind of lots of the current uh, uh, state-of-the-art experiments in, uh, in atomic physics are exactly using this Bose-Einstein condensate, and actually since a few weeks there's also a Bose-Einstein condensate made by uh, Karel van Akkolein here in, uh, in Ghent. So this is the first BEC in, uh, in, in, in Belgium. So another option is of course to have a huge density, like in stars. If you have a huge density, then of course there even a small wavelength can actually you can have overlaps and you will have quantum uh, mechanical kind of uh, nature. But of course there could also, there's a situation where the wavelength is much smaller than the average distance. This happens with noble gases and so for these systems you don't need quantum mechanics whatsoever. Okay, then, but again, somehow what was lacking? This, this is wave, particles are waves, particles are kind of, 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 of wave, and part, there's some duality, but, but that doesn't mean that you know basically what the wave function is. If you have waves, then of course you have to guess basically what is the wave function, and uh, what, what, is the, 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 what is the kind of the formulas, what, is the, what are the equations that govern how these waves kind of, of, of propagate themselves, how they, uh, uh, what, 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 how they evolve in time, and, um, and this is something certainly that the Broglie kind of, uh, or the Breu, there's, there's two different ways of pronouncing it, and they certainly did not kind of, 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 of get this. And also what was kind of completely missing is what happens if you have many particles. What happens, what are the equations of quantum mechanics if you start putting many particles together? How do you have to add the waves or how, how does this structure kind of, of, of go into this? And this was really the, 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 the really kind of decisive step in quantum mechanics was taken by Heisenberg and independently in Schrodinger. Uh, and they called it matrix and quantum mechanics. Uh, um, it was not obvious at all that these, um, these, 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 these formulations of quantum mechanics were equivalent. Okay, so one uses somehow the, the Heisenberg formalism, the other one the Schrodinger formalism, and, and it was then people like Dirac and von Neumann that really proved that indeed all these kind of formulations are equivalent. And it is actually, from a mathematical point of view, it's interesting. It's really kind of related to the fact that like functions on L2, like that you can completely characterize them by like their Fourier components. Okay, that there's somehow that, that a finite interval, like a continuous a finite interval is in some sense from the mathematical point of view equivalent to uh, uh, to uh, to the, the set of integers. Okay, this is like that. This is they are equally big, and one of them uses somehow the matrices. The other one basically uses analytical functions, and these two things are from the point of view of uh, mathematics uh, equivalent. And this is certainly kind of was based on the formalism of Hilbert spaces and so further. That's why we uh, call somehow quantum mechanics happens in the so-called Hilbert spaces. 
Okay, so uh, so what we have then is this uh, uh, this wave equation. Okay, and it still uh, took a while. So this is with this they immediately could predict lots of things. They could understand things like the periodic table of elements. Okay, this is like yeah, this was of course this is one this is amazing kind of thing. People had discovered this, like Mendeleev had discovered this, but there was no structure, there was no understanding of what whatsoever about this. So so by using the Schrödinger equation, you could immediately understand the full structure of uh, uh, of the atomic. Uh, 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 of the periodic table, uh, but many, many more things. So, so what you could understand, and this was like one of the biggest mysteries of all, you could understand why electrons do not kind of fall onto their kind of, of the nucleus. Why is it stable? Why do somehow, why is nature, like things, things that, that were completely mysterious is why is nature hard when I push on this table? Why does my finger not go into the table? Okay, these are all, some, some of this is, these are all things that were completely ununderstood from the classical mechanics point of view. Okay, and this is what it is, is why, why if I push on this table, that my finger does not go into this. This is really due to, to the fact that the particles are indistinguishable. But I have something like the uh, uh, Pauli exclusion principle that uh, that makes clear that electrons cannot occupy the same state. So there's lots of things that go into this, and this was all immediately clear uh, uh, after Heisenberg and Schrödinger formulated this quantum mechanics. So, so what is? I think it's it's a fair claim to say that that before quantum mechanics we did not understand anything about matter, and after quantum mechanics we understand quite some things about matter but there's still lots and lots of things to be discovered. Anyway, um, uh, what happened then a bit later uh, is, is, is Born. So Born was uh, basically the PhD advisor of, uh, uh, of Heisenberg, and he, uh, uh, he really wanted to understand what this means. Okay? It's not because you have a wave equation that you still have, you, you, you have an understanding of what is the meaning of this. How do you have to interpret uh, this wave equation? And he, uh, he was the first one to realize that, that this wave function is, to say it in the modern way, is a representation of the probability distribution that uh, governs somehow experiments that I would do on this particle. So, so the, the, the psi, the, the wave function, does not have any physical meaning. The psi is just a way, it's like, it's like a, an, an advanced way of encoding a probability distribution. It's just like a probability distribution is not, the, the system is not a probability distribution. No, it allows you to predict properties of a system. So it's not something that is physical. It's something that you, it's not that you can associate a wave to this kind of wave function. It's not that, that this is like a wave in, 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 in hydrodynamics that you can say this is the height of this thing and so forth. No, you cannot, so this, this wave function cannot, doesn't have, a, does not have really an, 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 an interpretation in terms of, of, of amplitude is more uh, a parameterization of the knowledge that we have about the system. Okay, and uh, so anyway, so what 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 this uh, what what happened there is that that he was able to to completely kind of fill or or complete somehow this these axioms of quantum mechanics that that basically uh, observables uh, are measured somehow. Basically, you take any Hermitian operator, you have the spectral theorem, you have eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues are the possible uh, expectation values like of energies. Uh, this kind of eigenvectors form a resolution of the identity. With this, you can probability you can predict probabilities of doing a measurement on, on your what what measurement outcomes you will have on your system and and of course the, the wave function is some kind of uh, normalized as uh, a normalized quantity uh, that uh, uh, is actually so it's not really so something that is completely underappreciated I think especially by uh, by people that uh, um, by I, I certainly did not appreciate it when I kind of take my courses in quantum mechanics in uh, neither in physics nor in uh, engineering is that that something very important is that this these wave functions form a projective space okay that that actually if you multiply a wave function with some arbitrary phase it's the same wave function and this looks very innocent but it's not innocent at all it is ex exactly this property that that allows uh, the, the 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 possibility of having fermions okay and that's and it's exactly because of fermions that you have basically the Pauli exclusion principle so if we, with wave functions would not have this projective character that I would not be able that don't have to identify wave functions that I multiply with the phase you would not it would not be possible to have fermions fermions and these fermions are basically the quantity especially this exclusion principle that explains uh, all of matter uh, in the world okay but uh, let's not 
let's try to go to the to the balletic quality. So, so one of the immediate consequences of of, of this formalism of quantum mechanics is again that we uh, is, is the superposition principle. Okay, that 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 wave functions are basically uh, vectors in some kind of a Hilbert space, projective vectors in a Hilbert space, and and you can take any superposition of these kind of uh, uh, wave functions. If, uh, because a vector, any vector, is basically corresponds to a physical uh, state, and therefore uh, it was possible to explain really completely now in complete general what these uh, interference experiments meant okay what is it why is it that we see interference okay and it's really these wave functions that uh, that that interfere these wave functions can have complex phases you add them up you see this interference print yours and uh, actually this is uh, the first uh, 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 like the state of the art experiments on interference is really that you can have big particles. These are buckyballs. These are buckyballs. These are like already quite some massive particles. You can actually really interfere this, and this is really done in the group of Zeilingers. Okay, this is the first time that we encounter one of the uh, uh, one of the Nobel Prize kind of winners of this year. This kind of experiments have been done by indeed uh, Anton Zeilinger, kind of really kind of doing interference experiments with pretty large molecules. Every theoretician uh, said this would be impossible. This is, of course, the hallmark of an experimentalist. Say, I don't care what theoreticians say; I will just do it. And he did it, and he saw interference. And then people, of course, after that, after the after he did it, kind of found explanations why it was possible. Uh, but uh, but anyway, these are very very nice experiments. Okay, so what is somehow the the, the what, what is very crucial in, 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 in interpreting or in understanding somehow the, the wave nature of, uh, uh, of, of particles, of quantum particles, is the, the Heisenberg kind of uncertainty relation. And this is, as you will see, this was also, this is exactly somehow the, the quantity or the, the, the thing that bothered, uh, that bothered people like Einstein. Okay, he was really bothered with this Heisenberg uncertainty relation and somehow all the EPR work that he did later was exactly kind of meant to, uh, uh, to debunk that, to find counterexamples to somehow this Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So, so what it tells you is that basically that that I cannot both know the the, the, the position and the momentum uh, of a particle uh, uh, extremely fine. The better kind of I I know somehow the so these are the variances of somehow the predictions out of if I would do a measurement on the position. These are the variance if I would do a measurement on my uh, momentum and and the product of these two variances has to be larger than uh, than h bar. Okay, so there is something like. So, so what it tells you is that that quantum mechanics at some point gives you some smallest length scale, and if you kind of get into this length scale in which this 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 h bar becomes relevant, then then indeed you cannot localize a particle more than this anymore. And and um, so it means that that well, both yeah, I cannot have both the position and momentum. These are complementary variables. There's something strange with it. And uh, there is actually for this particular fact, there is really an intuitive explanation that is possible uh, uh, that that explains this. Okay, so what is this? Is really this 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 very um, uh, this, this this point of view that 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 physics is about observation and indeed it's it's about predicting outcomes of experiments and this is exactly what quantum mechanics is also no it's not it's a theory of predicting it allows you to make predictions of measurements so uh, so this is really what quantum mechanics is about and indeed uh, if you kind of of try to understand what does it mean that an electron has a very precise position well it would mean that if i would i would be able to measure it okay it has a position then i should be able to observe what the position is but if you want to observe the position of a particle very precisely you will have to use light with a very kind of small wavelength and as kind of the formulas of, of planck and einstein tell you that actually this the energy and the momentum of these particles with very small wavelength these photons are very large and this momentum will kind of basically uh, coincide well will so so we'll have some collision with this particle and of course this light will really perturb your particle okay so the more precise you want to localize your uh, your quantum particle your electron the more you will disturb it okay and this is if you kind of start doing this 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 exercise you will see that indeed this is exactly what comes out this is this kind of uncertainty relation is exactly kind of of, of, of compatible with this fact that if you observe something you have to kind of influence you will kind of disturb it you cannot do a measurement without disturbing your thing if you are really kind of talking about elementary particles okay so this as i said einstein 
could not live with this. Okay, so so he, from his point of view, this whole quantum mechanics, although he was extremely extreme instrumental in 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 the development of quantum mechanics, he could never live with this. He could never live with the fact that that somehow this momentum and this and this, and this position that these were not properties of the particle that somehow one that they would kind of coincide. And he he was uh, he was always kind of trying to to find counterexamples. So there's this very famous uh, conference here in Solvay, and uh, I think this was in 27. Uh, you, of course, you see Einstein here. You see, uh, I think this is Dirac. This is Schrödinger. This is uh, Heisenberg. So all the big. There's only one woman, unfortunately. This was Marie Curie. But anyway, so this during this this whole conference, which was about quantum mechanics, this is like in 27, two years after the uh, the, the quantum mechanics kind of was discovered. Uh, he he tried to debunk it. He every kind of, of 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 morning he would kind of, of of wake up with a new idea why quantum mechanics was wrong. And it was always examples of 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 counterexamples, kind of thought experiments by which he could debunk. He kind of could find kind of cases in which you would be able to measure both position and momentum much more precisely than allowed by somehow Heisenberg uncertainty relations. And then Bohr uh, took, took a whole day of, for Bohr was like the, the, he was the, like the smartest guy, and they were discussing to to basically find the loophole in the argument. And, and Einstein kept on finding kind of counterexamples. And at some point, it was kind of he really kind of the, he found something that nobody was able to debunk. And uh, and at the end, um, what happened is that Bohr also debunked this. This was actually about some kind of energy time kind of analog of the uncertainty principle. So what what uh, what Einstein had forgotten to include was actually general relativity. Okay, so so in his example, he had he was considering a clock, and actually this clock ticks with a certain time. You can you can kind of know what the what is what the precision is of this clock and so further. But if it releases a photon, the weight changes, and therefore the gravitational field changes, and therefore the clock kind of starts clicking ticking slower. And he had forgotten that. And that's actually to kind of this one example that he kind of drew was was really kind of again saved by Bohr uh, by including general relativity so 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 but this this characterizes Einstein Einstein was was extremely was really a rebel and he hated it that basically after kind of this relativity he was such a famous guy that everybody thought that what he was saying was right he wanted always to be adversary he wanted to be somehow he did not like to be an institution himself and uh, and that's why he saw it as his mission to kind of basically always uh, play the advocate of the devil but uh, anyway um, this whole idea of, of, of trying to, to, uh, uh, to, he didn't believe somehow in quantum mechanics. And, and one of the main reasons that he didn't believe in quantum mechanics is that, that this whole notion of probabilities, of, 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 uh, yeah, of, of probabilities is, is inherent in quantum mechanics. That, that there is no, normally you would think that, that probabilities uh, just arise in physics because we don't have the full knowledge about the system. Okay, there's like some parameters that we don't know precisely, and that's basically the where 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 the statistical nature of of of, of physics comes into. This is exactly what happens in statistical physics. Uh, but uh, but in quantum mechanics, it's clear that this whole probability or, or the whole notion of 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 uh, uh, yeah of, of 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 having somehow that the, the fact that a system does not have exact properties, but that you can cannot say this is the property of the system. No, you can only say this is the probability by which I will measure something and get I mean, this is the probability of a certain outcome and he he hated this and was trying to keep on finding counterexamples and finally he he thought that he succeeded uh, in 30 uh, in 35 okay in 35 he wrote this uh, famous paper uh, the Einstein Pod with, Einstein, with Podolsky and Rosen uh, in which he basically kind of told you that there's some that basically quantum mechanics makes some completely ridiculous kind of predictions that cannot be true so what they did is actually write down a wave function okay a wave function of two particles um, actually as you will see this is like the first time an entangled state was written down he has two particles and he says actually if I kind of look at the observables x1 minus x2 and p1 and p2 so you all know the commutation relations of x and p but actually the combination of x1 minus x2 commutes with p1 plus p2 so this means that indeed you can actually have precise values for both of these kind of things and then he says let me if I do a measurement on my second particle Okay, and I kind of measure the momentum, then I know immediately what the momentum is of my first particle. If I kind of measure somehow my position of my second particle, I also know immediately what the position has to be of my first particle. So he says that means that I have a way of kind of knowing exactly what the position and momentum is of my other particle. Because there is a measurement by which I can identify basically this P 
the, the, the momentum, because if this if measures some momentum, I get an outcome, then the momentum of the first particle is just the opposite of it. And the same kind of for my position, then of course it has to be like L minus the other kind of thing. Um, and then this, this of course confused, uh, this was confusing, and it took really a few weeks for uh, uh, for Bohr to, to formulate the question. By the way, whenever Einstein wrote papers, this was like front page news. No? So this was like, he was the biggest celebrity that existed in the whole world, not just in physics, he was just the biggest celebrity that had ever existed. So anything he did, there was like always journalists, whatever. And uh, like like in this particular case, he wrote this paper and then uh, immediately this was front page news in the New York Times. And uh, uh, this is actually, I, I, we cannot kind of, I don't think we can really kind of, of there's nothing like that anymore. I don't know exactly why people were so uh, captivated by, by him, but of course this was somebody with a huge amount of charisma. Anyway, so what was the reply of Bohr? Because Bohr was always the one that, that had to debunk this, 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 this counter example. He said, well, basically, it, it might be true what you say is if you know the momentum of this particle, then you know the momentum of the other one. And if you know the position, you know the position of the other one. But you cannot do a measurement that reveals both at the same time. So what he says is that this is what is called counterfactual reasoning. So you cannot design a simultaneous measurement of both position and momentum. So, so that means that you will not be able to know the position and momentum of this particle at the same time. Okay, and um, um, so... And this is kind of was then kind of phrased in terms of the principle of complementarity that that's uh, um, that somehow some types of predictions are possible, others are not because they are related to mutually incompatible tests. Okay, and uh, by the way, also another kind of thing that Einstein, why Einstein was so much uh, against this, I mean, why he was so 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 much convinced that this EPR example uh, would 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 be in violation with with the way physics works is that that it feels that there's some instantaneous kind of, of, of spooky action at a distance, because if I know, because I do a position measurement, then immediately I know the position of the other particle. So there's something that goes faster than the speed of light. Okay, so so the, um, the, the mistake that he made there is, again, very subtle. It's not because somehow if I do a measurement here that, and I know immediately what happens with the, the somehow measurement outcome of the other kind of particle. If I would match x1 and I get, I know immediately what x2 is. Um, it's not that this that that I can I can send information by doing such kind of a measurement. Okay, they only know what the correlations are, but the theory of relativity only tells you that you cannot send information faster than the speed of light. That does not mean that correlations kind of cannot be kind of created faster than the speed of light. It's just correlations, and correlations is not. Uh, there's not a, it's not because you have a correlation that you can use this to send information because you cannot control what outcomes you will get. And this is a very subtle kind of difference between correlations and, 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 and information. Um, anyway, so um, so Einstein uh, yeah, kind of succumbed. He, he, he agreed that indeed there's some counterfactual reasoning there and then decided that indeed there's basically two, well, that, that somehow that, he, that, that there's, there's, there's two possible ways of getting out. So basically what he wanted to say is that the description of means of the, the psi function, these are his own words, is uh, complete. So this is so either this is not true, so there's some properties in your kind of wave function that uh, um, that 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 you can uh, it's not complete, uh, or somehow uh, the real states of spatially separated objects are independent of each other. So so and of course somehow it turns out that uh, that the first assertion will be true, but the second assertion will not be true, and that's the one that he could not accept. He thought some particle or some 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 some. Well, some matter has properties independent uh, somehow of uh, of how we will look at it. Okay, so the properties of this particle, if I have sp kind of of, of space-like separated particles, then then somehow there's nothing that I can do here that will influence any kind of possible outcome there. And and somehow the the yeah, so he 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 could not. He could not believe that, that that there's some kind of a very strange correlation that would create would, would create it. And and indeed, this is, this point of view that he did not want to uh, he want to accept this is, is is really called Einstein locality. Okay, so so again in his words uh, he says that uh, in his opinion uh, that that. The factual situation, like the real factual situation of the system S2, he calls it, is independent of what is done with system S1, which is separated from the former in a space-like separated region. Okay, so he cannot, he, he does not uh, appreciate, he does not want this. So he, from him, from his point of view, uh, the fact that 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 you have this kind of correlations and you have this probability uh, distribution there that 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 governs somehow the the the, the, the measurement outcomes or the correlations between these things is just that just because we don't have a complete theory, okay? That quantum mechanics is like a sub 
theory of some bigger theory that is actually classical and is deterministic, but it's just that there's some variables there that we don't understand. Okay, there's some variables that we don't have access to. There's some physics going on there that we don't understand. And somehow he really wants to save somehow the fact that that there is kind of that quantum mechanics is just some sub kind of, of, of theory of a bigger theory that actually satisfies somehow the classical axioms. Um, as we will see, somehow, uh, this is exactly what Bell kind of debunked. Okay, so he kind of shows that indeed this is not true. This kind of, of point of view of Bell, of, of Einstein, is, is, is in violation with, uh, uh, with actually our world. Okay, but the first one to, uh, uh, to answer basically uh, the, uh, this attacks of quantum, me to, to quantum mechanics of, 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 of Einstein was actually Schrodinger. And Schrodinger was very much sympathetic to uh, Einstein. So Schrodinger was also like one of the older people that uh, discovered quantum mechanics and he thought that quantum mechanics was just ridiculous okay he thought that 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 indeed quantum mechanics cannot be the full thing and for this he kind of just as a reply to einstein he said well indeed you you come up with this epr example i can come up with even a more stupid example that tells you that indeed it is impossible quantum mechanics must be wrong okay this is not uh, so these days we take this schrodinger's cat as somehow being a hallmark of quantum mechanics but for schrodinger uh, this was really like a joke no he thought that if you would have quantum mechanics and take quantum mechanics seriously i can have superpositions of a cat being dead and alive Life, and of course, this cannot be true. Okay, this is, well, this is just uh, the, his first reply, but then he had a second reply that was actually started uh, or, or, or coined the term entanglement. So, so Schrodinger uh, also kind of looked at this, this, this whole problem of EPR uh, from a more kind of uh, uh, mathematical point of view. And uh, he realized that actually the whole problem in, in interpreting what happens in this experiment, this EPR kind of thought experiment, is the fact that there's entanglement, that there's kind of non-trivial correlations between these things. It's just a, a consequence of the fact that you can have superpositions okay the superposition principle allows you to have like superpositions of indeed this thing this particle being up and down and down and up and you can have arbitrary superpositions between things like that and uh, and so he realized that 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 if you have a system that is described by uh, a, a state that is entangled that actually all the information is in 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 in, in the whole of the system not in the individual parts of the system so so if you have a classical description of a system if you have a classical system and you have complete knowledge of all the subparts of the system, uh, then you know the whole system. Okay? There's nothing left anymore. If I have a kind of a pure state and I know all the particular kind of parts, like all the, 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 the states of all the different particles, I have the full kind of description of the state. In quantum mechanics, this is not like that at all. If I kind of just know the local properties of my particles, this tell, doesn't tell me anything about the global features of my particles. So this is, well, this is just, uh, he was the first one to appreciate that entanglement really kind of, of has some very kind of fundamental uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, consequences in, in interpreting what does it mean to have full knowledge about uh, the system. And this is, so he kind of really coined this term of entanglement. So, so by the way, Schrodinger, this is a picture. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows. I would really like to know where this picture was taken. This picture was taken in Ghent. Schrodinger was a professor in Ghent in 39. Uh, this is Schrodinger in the Panne. He kind of spent lots of time in the Panne. Uh, this is supposedly a picture of Schrodinger in Ghent. And this was like a golden age of, of Ghent University. You know? There was Schrodinger. There's also like the person who discovered like or first synthesized vitamin C. There's like very famous mathematicians. This is just all before the war. Somehow, apparently, Ghent university was a gather point for all these kind of very famous people that all got Nobel prizes and so further anyway um then uh, let's take a leap to 51 because somehow then after Schrodinger made all these things, well, people people were too busy with 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 coming up with applications of quantum mechanics. This was like Einstein and Schrodinger. Well, they had basically they they had said that quantum mechanics is weird, but but this was people were not too much bothered by this because there was so much work to be done uh, uh, about uh, applications of quantum physics. There was nuclear physics, there was solid state physics, there was like chemistry. There were so many amazing things to be discovered in quantum mechanics that really nobody bothered looking at somehow these more foundational issues uh, until uh, David Bohm in 51 kind of rehashed or kind of, of wrote a textbook actually. And, and, and in this textbook, he he rephrased this EPR paradox in, in much uh, in, 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 in terms of, of, of simple spins, in terms of much much simpler kind of things that actually would allow you to do experiments. Okay, so so he he kind of rephrased these kind of things in terms of polarizations or kind of spin one halves or there's many 
kind of other ways in which you could do this, and realized that you would maybe you would really be able to do experiments uh, with this uh, with, with with such systems. You would be able, in principle, to create systems, uh, especially photons that are in such superpositions. They will be able to to see whether Einstein was right uh, or wrong. Okay, and uh, this example that he gave was was well, exactly like I have to spin one half, so a two level system, and my first particle can be let's say polarized uh, along the x axis. The, the, so this is around. Well, so we have orthogonal states, and this is a zero, one minus one zero. So it's like you're in a superposition of somehow being in two different states. And what is important is this minus sign. And then uh, if you would take uh, seriously somehow the arguments of local realism, this Einstein uh, uh, locality, then it would basically tell you that if I would do a measurement of sigma x, sigma y, or sigma z, these properties are already encoded in this wave function. Okay, so 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 what what is special to this wave function is that this wave function is actually completely invariant under rotation. So if I kind of look at this wave function at different bases, I rotate somehow both my spins in a different bases, I get exactly the same wave function. Okay, this is actually very simple linear algebra to see this. So that means that any any observable that you measure, and typically this is like the Pauli matrix, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, you, you measure any of these observables. If I kind of measure one spin in one direction, I will always kind of measure the other spin in exactly the opposite uh, direction. So there's some kind of strong correlations there. And from the point of view of Einstein, somehow he said, well, I should be able to, so these properties, these outcomes of these, of these particles, well, I they are there, they are already encoded there. I have these two particles, one can be in Ghent, the other one can be anywhere, can be on the moon. Um, somehow the, the properties that somehow decides what the correlations are, these properties should already be there, independent of what measurement I uh, will do. And this is, of course, a bit strange because somehow these, these observables certainly do not commute, so you cannot have, you cannot do an experiment experiment that both measures sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. So there's again this whole notion of counterfactual kind of reasoning that is not really compatible with this. But anyway, so uh, then it took another 14 years or 13 years uh, for John Bell to come into stage. And this is really somehow the, these are really kind of, this changed the whole game. Because until then, people were debating whether quantum mechanics was complete or not, and people had no idea. They thought, well, this is just some philosophical question, but we will never be able to actually test whether quantum mechanics is this, or just a sub-theory of a much bigger theory that is classical. Okay? It was not clear at all whether it would be possible or not. It was like clear that it would be difficult to construct such a theory, but, but John Bell in uh, 1964, he wrote two complete two landmark papers. So, so the first one, which is not very well known, is basically that he kind of constructs a classical theory that completely is completely compatible with quantum theory. So he constructs a classical theory that allows you to kind of get all the outcomes uh, of a quantum system. Okay, so, so, so he kind of constructs indeed a bigger matter. He constructs a classical theory in a bigger phase space. Uh, and if you, that, that, that is completely kind of indistinguishable uh, from a quantum kind of, 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 from quantum mechanics. So any measurement or anything you would do with your kind of quantum system, you would kind of be able to mimic this with a completely classical system that, uh, uh, that, 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 well, that, that has some kind of more variables, some local hidden, some hidden variables, he calls it. So, uh, so this is the first paper. This was something that von Neumann and other people had decided would be impossible, but of course they actually made mistakes in their proofs. Uh, but, uh, but in the second one, and this is really kind of the really famous paper, he kind of looked at his hidden variable models and he realized that if I have, if I look at entangled states, namely I want to kind of understand this EPR paradox, when you look at entanglement and you kind of combine somehow this whole notion of, 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 of locality with somehow these quantum correlations, then there's something very strange happening. Now, like if I kind of, uh, of take somehow the fact that there's this local, I just do not take general hidden variable models, but I take local hidden variable models, then certainly the predictions that I can make from these classical theories are very different than the ones that I can make from quantum theory. And that you can really kind of experimentally principle check uh, these kind of, 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 of different kind of, of, of possible outcomes. Okay, so, so, so what uh, the consequence of this, of this, I will kind of talk more about this, but anyway, he, what, what, the consequence of this whole discussion that that, that Bell opens is is, is 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 basically that indeed uh, if you do an, if we do an experiment and it and it it, it shows you that uh, somehow the, the 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 correlations that you get 
uh, are kind of not compatible with this local hidden variable models, it immediately implies that this randomness in quantum mechanics is, is inherent, okay? that, that this is incircumventable, that this is a property of quantum mechanics, and that this randomness does not arise because of ignorance about the bigger system. Okay? And this is exactly what Einstein and Schrodinger thought would be. So, uh, so some kind of call this the most profound discovery of science. I think this is a bit exaggerated, but nevertheless, it, this is, it, it, it's very nice that, that quantum mechanics opens this whole debate of what does it mean to understand the system. What does it mean to 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 to, to yeah, what what how does nature work in in general? But let's briefly go somehow to these to these papers to these two papers of John Bell. Okay, so first of all, his what is this hidden variable model that is kind of indistinguishable from quantum mechanics? So so let's say let's take the simplest example. Let's take a two-level system, uh, a spin one half particles, and all the observables are just two by two Hermitian matrices. Okay, so, so basically this is a linear combination of the Pauli matrices, and then um, quantum mechanics predicts uh, that if you do a measurement somehow, you will get an expect you have a certain state psi. Well, the expectation value of this observable will just be somehow this given by this formula of quantum mechanics again that's that's it so what he does is, is actually construct a very simple hidden variable model that gives you the same expectation values. so what he says is that every physical system has something like an extra hidden variable lambda and this lambda is uniformly distributed between minus one and one okay so that means that that actually my my physical system my my classical system that lives in a bigger phase space has indeed some continuous variable lambda and uh, and it's just distributed between minus one and one uniformly we don't we don't know what it is but every system has actually a lambda associated to it again for any lambda that you have uh, the uh, the result of the measurement is plus one if somehow you just calculate, well, of course, these are just two by two matrices, so you can calculate this expectation value. So you say, but this probability, this measurement is uh, plus one, with this, uh, when lambda is smaller than this kind of thing, then the outcome is minus one. And you can check easily that indeed, if I have such a system, I would, would do measurements on many, many, many uh, states. Uh, many, I would do an experiment, I would repeat many, an experiment many times. The average would exactly coincide with the average predicted by quantum mechanics. Okay, so this kind of showed that indeed, it is possible to have hidden variable models uh, that have the same expectation values. But now the real kind of deal was the second paper that he wrote, that he realized that these hidden variable models would become problematic uh, if you have, if you apply them to, 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 to correlated systems, to entangled systems. Okay, so, uh, um, so he, uh, well, it's really, he kind of tries to, to understand the paradox now. He tries to apply his hidden variable model uh, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to this EPR. By the way, if, if you kind of look carefully, you see this paper, this paper was published in 64. This paper was published in 66. So this is just because at that time, this was still considered so much kind of weird that people did not want to kind of work on, 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 on foundations that it took more than two years for him to publish this. So after this experience that it was impossible to publish a paper like that, he founded his own journal, uh, basically physics. <laughs> and therefore, this was published immediately because it was his own journal. Um, anyway. Uh, um, so this is the real paper. This is the real deal. So, um, uh, so he, he basically tells you that, that indeed these, these hidden variable models, um, um, if you additionally add this whole idea of Einstein locality, that a system has has properties independent somehow of the other one if they are kind of spatially separated from each other, um, that, that basically these hidden variable models have to satisfy some constraints that quantum systems do not have, kind of, do, do, do not satisfy. So let me kind of, of go briefly somehow to, uh, let me try to explain basically what, what this, this whole thing is about. So he, he basically kind of considers some photons, so that are kind of generated by, he calls it like an, an, an SPS cascade. So anyway, what, what happens is that you have two photons and they are perfectly correlated to each other. They, they, are, they are both somehow, uh, or well, if you, you have kind of two, uh, you have your polarizations, and uh, anyway, they are perfectly correlated. They're even in the x or the y. And if one is in the x, the other one is in the x. If it's in the y, the other one is in the y. And um, that means that if you do a measurement of one of these particles, you basically know immediately what the outcome will be of the other particle. And then he kind of starts also looking at what, what happens if I kind of measure a different polarization. I kind of rotate somehow my second. Uh, uh, my second sample, uh, my, uh, the detector of my second particle, and you can perfectly predict somehow what uh, the outcome will be or what the correlations will be between these two outcomes. Okay, um, but anyway, so, so let's now 
try to understand what a classical model would be, what, what classical systems would predict in such kind of a case. So, so basically, uh, this is out of a book of Asher Perez, which is actually very nice if you are interested in quantum foundations. This is certainly the best book that was ever written. Um, um, so certainly he says, look, let, let, me, let me consider actually the case of a, of, of a classical particle that, uh, that, that, that is rotation invariant. It's a bomb that basically explodes into two parts. And of course, I have kind of conservation of angular momentum. And if somehow one uh, particle has some kind of a certain momentum in uh, direction J1. The other one has exactly somehow the, 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 mom, the angular momentum in the other direction. So this is basically a model of a classical uh, perfectly correlated thing. And it's completely random what actually this angular momentum will be. And I'll kind of come up with some classical observables. Let me kind of take, uh, so, so observer A just kind of decides to kind of measure somehow the has some some axis some alpha so just this is a normalized a normalized vector uh, alpha and he just says okay let this is this kind of angular momentum of my first particle in the same direction of alpha like I just take the sign this doesn't seem to work anymore here um, okay Ah, yeah, here. So you just take as observables the sign of this alpha times j1, uh, and there's another axis that he kind of decides, and where he just says, okay, let me kind of take the sign of beta j2. So, so there's like uh, the, the the one observer kind of just just measures whether what the sign is of alpha j1, the other one measures what the sign is of beta j2. So the outcomes of these measurements of this of this experiment is always a plus or a minus uh, one, and then you are basically interested in understanding. Okay, you repeat this experiment many times and you calculate things like my expectation value of alpha but i but also what is the expectation value of the product of these two outcomes can you it's a very simple uh, uh, it's a very simple kind of exercise to do this and you will see that indeed somehow the outcome the expectation value of the product of somehow these two observables is basically minus 1 plus 2 theta divided by pi and there's a kind of a very simple geometrical way of seeing for what kind of angles will these kind of things coincide and we'll give plus minus uh, plus 1 and minus 1 but anyway so but let's Let's contrast this experiment to uh, uh, to the classical case. Uh, maybe the okay. We'll have to probably maybe the battery went out. I don't know. Okay, let me or this whole thing crashed. Right. Did it move? I cannot go to the next slide. I don't know. Nee, maar ik kan ook als ik hier op duw, dan werk ik het niet. Normaal, als je hier op de spatie duwt, moet je naar de volgende slide gaan. Ja, ah, nu. Okay, good. Okay, anyway, if you do this uh, quantum mechanically, you do exactly the same experiment. You kind of measure somehow. You, you choose you 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 choose these these two axes, and you exp you calculate the expectation value of the product of these two observables. What you see is that you don't get this straight line like you get somehow uh, for this uh, 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 classical kind of bump that that you from which you measure basically the, the angular momentum. What you get is correlations that are much stronger. Okay, the correlations are given by cos theta and instead of somehow this linear thing. So, the, so classically, what you expect, what you predict, is that the correlations between these, uh, depending on the, on the difference in angle in which kind of both observers measure their kind of particles, so this is alpha and this beta, depending on the angle between these two kind of measurement axes, uh, you, you, you get some correlations. And classically, you get this straight line. Uh, quantumly, you get basically this cosine. Okay, so, so what you have is, in very, some very strange way, you get always stronger correlations quantumly than classically between the two outcomes. Okay, so, so, so that means that, well, because you see the, the, the expectation value of this AB is cos theta as opposed to somehow the previous expectation value was just minus 1 plus 2 theta plus pi. Okay, so, so this is basically, this was the, the, the fundamental insight of, of, uh, of Bell. He said, look, there is something there. There is a type of correlation that I have in uh, an entangled system that is much stronger than I can have in a classical system. Okay, and uh, he goes further and actually kind of proves that indeed um, this, is, this, this, this will be the case for any classical model. So I gave you kind of one example of a classical model by which I would be able to measure this, but he kind of basically proves that any classical model that satisfies the rules of local realism of this Einstein locality uh, would, you would always kind of basically just get this straight line. You will never be able to kind of get correlations as strong as the ones you get for a quantum system. So basically what he kind of considers, and this is really completely, this was really ingenious and it's a bit difficult to, 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 to explain in a, in a simple way, but 
but somehow he he considers exactly that that I have this entangled state, and um, um, the, the the first observer can choose somehow to measure one two observables, and the two observables are kind of just basically these Pauli matrices, but they are related to somehow a different angle between them. Okay, so this is possible if he measures either kind of observable A. Uh, or, or observable C, but of course, because it's an observable with uh, it's just an, 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 a matrix, it's like a linear combination of Pauli matrices, the outcomes, the eigenvalues are always plus and minus one. So, so the measurement outcomes are always plus and minus one. Um, and then of, actually the, this other observable kind of does measurements in different bases, in a different basis B and C, but the outcomes of this kind of measurement are always also plus and minus one. And then of course, that means that he's considering basically the outcome of these observables to be there independent of somehow the fact that I can do this experiment or not. So there's this whole counterfactual reasoning that is again popping up here. He, because from, from the point of view of Einstein, this, this, these particles, they must have this property kind of depending on, on this parameter lambda or some kind of unknown parameter, but they have this property independent of what this lambda is. So for a given particle, I will have these properties. Somehow this, the, 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 the fact that, that this system has uh, a particular value should not depend on whether I measure this thing and what basis I measure the other thing or not. Okay, so anyway, so all these numbers A, B, and C, they are all kind of between, they are plus one or minus one. And if they're plus or minus one, then you see that this product of these numbers well, is just equal to this. This is just very simple kind of, 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 of a, yeah, very simple algebra. If A, B, and C are all plus or minus one, then you can immediately see that, uh, uh, that, that this kind of thing is always true. So that means that if you average now the expectation value of somehow the left hand side, this must always be smaller than the absolute value. If you take the absolute value somehow of this of the expectation value, this must of course be equal to smaller than the expectation for the absolute value of this. And therefore you get some kind of an inequality. And if you kind of write down this inequality for these uh, angles, depending on what you have, like for this bomb, you would get somehow inequalities that relate uh, somehow to these angles between the different kind of measurement operators. But anyway, so you see that classically for any hidden variable model for which these properties are there independent on what measurement I do. Of course, again, the, the mistake here in this local hidden variable model is this counterfactual reasoning. No, he's, he's kind of assuming that, 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 um, that these properties are there um, independent, even if I cannot measure so that, that I can take these expectation values uh, even if I cannot kind of measure these different things simultaneously. Okay, so this is so basically Bell. The whole subtlety of Bell's theorem is 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 about this classical hidden variable models. It's like this hidden variable models has nothing to do with the quantum. The quantum kind of predictions are very simple. What 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 Bell realized is if you have a classical description of your system, then the correlations in this classical system will satisfy some non-trivial constraints, some non-trivial inequalities, and these are these so-called Bell inequalities. Namely, that somehow if I do this experiment and I calculate these expectation values, there's something that is has to satisfy. This. And uh, look, for example, in this particular case, uh, you would get that the angles, while this plus this, the absolute value of the difference of these two plus this is more than one. You actually take this quantum state, okay, this 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 quantum state that uh, you would be able to produce maybe with, with photons or any kind of other kind of means, and you kind of calculate basically what is the outcome of this left hand side, and you would see that this is three halves. This is very simple expectation value of these kind of things. So you see that quantum mechanics violates basically the possibility of having hidden variable models or local hidden variable models for this kind of system. Okay, so uh, um, let's uh, um, so of course, so this was this was a big deal. Okay, so he really kind of makes a prediction that if you would do an experiment on a quantum system, you will kind of get you will be able to get numbers that are impossible to get with any uh, uh, theory that would kind of have a local hidden variable interpretation. Okay, so it doesn't matter what this theory, this bigger theory would be, you have to satisfy this inequality. And if you do a quantum experiment and you see that this number is larger than one, you must have made a mistake. There must have been something that is kind of well, inconsistent, and there's, of course, the inconsistency is that the, that these local hidden variable models are completely impossible, are not in are in violation with with uh, with quantum mechanics. Okay, so this was basically the status of Bell, um, but of course, somehow in the case of Bell, this is still not. Um, 
he does not allow for any kind of errors. Okay, if you do any experiment, you will have to. Well, you will have to. You, of course, you will not be able to kind of do measurements exactly. You will have some errors, some epsilon errors, and so further. And 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 somehow his experiment was not really. This, it's not that he kind of he he saw that there's some kind of an incompatibility between quantum mechanics and classical physics or or this hidden variable models. But but somehow to do an actual experiment, uh, you, you you really have to kind of, of of work a little bit harder. And this is exactly what uh, John Close kind of did. Okay, John Closer uh, was a PhD student at that time that really kind of got fascinated by this uh, uh, by Bell's theorem. And uh, and and in uh, in 69, so uh, like five years later, uh, kind of, of of try to understand how you could test this actually. How would you be able to to do a test of this uh, of this of this prediction of Bell uh, in 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 a way that um, that 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 you can take into account experimental errors. Okay, and this is, uh, so this is the very famous CHSH inequality, so Closer, Horn, Schimoni, and Holt. Uh, so this is a pure theoretical paper uh, in which they kind of rephrased the whole thing a little bit. They said, okay, let me, let me actually have a situation in which I uh, have these two particles of these two, these two parties, and, and the first party can measure in one direction or the other direction. The other one can also measure in two possible directions. Let's try to see what the possible correlations are. If I have a local hidden variable model, well, somehow all these outcomes, A, B, C, and D, they're all plus and minus one. So again, I get somehow equalities like this. So if I kind of take the absolute value of this thing, that means that somehow this expectation value has to be smaller than two. For any local hidden variable model, this is the CHSH inequality. So this is something that helps for all local hidden variable models. Now, you do the experiment, you, do, you, you check actually what this expectation value would be uh, for uh, a quantum system, and you see that actually it can be larger than two. Certainly, so like for these maximally entangled states of two spins, what you can get here is two times square root of two, which is quite a bit larger. And uh, because this is actually an experiment that you can do, you, that's exactly what these Bell, uh, Bell inequality experiments do. They, they create basically an entangled state, and then they, um, you have to kind of do measurements in different possible directions, look at all the possible statistics, of somehow the correlations between them. And if you see that the correlations are larger than you can get classically, you know that there's no local hidden variable model that explains it. And that means that actually quantum mechanics is there, is there to stay. There's no, there's no way that somehow quantum mechanics, the, the uncertainty or somehow the, 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 the probability, the fact that you have to deal with probabilities is, is just there because of the ignorance of somehow a bigger classical uh, theory. Okay, so this was uh, the theory paper. Then it took three more years to actually do the experiment, and this is actually really why uh, Clauser got the Nobel Prize. He uh, he considered some kind of a photons that were kind of correlated, that were very close to somehow this maximally entangled state. Then somehow you kind of have polarizers. Uh, I think well, the people in the audience are better kind of uh, positions than me to understand what all of this means. But anyway, they did an experiment and they kind of saw that indeed what somehow their system is. Is, is, is completely compatible with the predictions of quantum mechanics and actually in violation with the classical theory. Okay, but there were still some loopholes, and this is exactly where people like Aspe and Zeilinger will kind of come into stage. So, for example, what you could imagine is that somehow, so, so what is actually important in, in interpreting these, these, these results, right, is that, that, that these two observers, they choose basically the, the measurement that they will do independently. Okay, so they cannot kind of correlate the measurements they will do. Okay, so it's very important that, that both somehow the measurement outcomes of Alice or somehow the direction which they will measure and the, that that one person will measure and the other person that this is completely kind of independent from each other. So what that means is that in principle you would like to design an experiment. So so you could you could imagine that there is something like 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 uh, um, that, that, that nature is really kind of malicious and, and, and decides after the photon has been created or the, the photon, entangled photon pair that only then somehow it is decided which, which directions you will measure. So, so if, if, if Alice and Bob somehow, depending on the state that they have, measure in a certain basis, you would actually, even with a classical model, be able to violate these Bell inequalities. So it must, it's very important that these, these choices are made kind of completely independently. And this is exactly what Alain Aspet did. Okay, so what Alain Aspet did uh, was a kind of really extremely difficult experiment, apparently. Uh, so he, uh, he kind of designed an experiment such that somehow the decision in what basis to measure is only made after somehow the, 
uh, the, uh, the, the, the entangled pair is created. And actually that this decision, that this information on what basis is measured here cannot be transmitted to the other side uh, because somehow it goes so fast. Okay, so you kind of really have to kind of, 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 of fight against the speed of light there. You have to kind of make the decision and, and then measure it on a certain basis and make sure that what you measure here somehow cannot be this information of what basis you measured here is kind of, 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 of this information is completely impossible to kind of be known to the other side. Okay, so this is, and this is what Aspect kind of took, well, it took clearly 10 more years to, to do this. He really worked extremely hard on this for six years to do this. And this is basically closing the so-called loophole, the, the fact that, that indeed these measurements have to be independent, that, that, that somehow there is, there is that, 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 this, that nature cannot be that malicious. He kind of tried to, to check this, and this is exactly what he did. And this is, uh, uh, well, this is a very famous experiment. And then, actually, but there's still... Uh, another loophole, and this was only kind of closed much later, and this was actually uh, in 2015, uh, and this is where Anton Zeilinger comes into stage, namely somehow there's still the detection efficiency. So, so if you kind of take the experiment of ASPE uh, into account, there's actually, you, had, you need to have photon detectors. And if, um, so basically what ASPE did is just post-select. He kind of only kind of look, looked at somehow the, the, the experimental data conditioned on the fact that both detectors clicked. Okay, but, but of course, a detector, a photon detector, does not have uh, a very good uh, uh, detection efficiency. So in some sense, it would still have been possible to, to, to close this loophole. You would say that actually the detectors would only click uh, uh, if somehow the results would be compatible with quantum mechanics and you would still be able, to, with the classical hidden variable model, we would be able to make use of somehow this detection inefficiency uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to violate these bell inequalities. And this is exactly the loophole that was closed uh, by, uh, by Anton Zeilinger. Uh, and, and it took so long because indeed uh, to, to be able to do this experiment, you needed to have very efficient uh, photon detectors. Anyway, um, many other people that uh, kind of did this at the same time uh, uh, and uh, and anyway so this chsh this uh, kind of inequality it's always the same chhh inequality so they this is now kind of rephrased in terms of some uh, uh, some entanglements some some correlations some games uh, you can actually see that actually this this quantum correlations can be used to do information tasks that were impossible before but i, I probably have to stop now i'm uh, i'm a, i uh, i will kind of uh, so so what is the reason that, that somehow these people got the Nobel Prize now? It's basically that this is indeed this whole, this whole business of, 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 of entanglement and bell inequalities. This, this opened up a completely new way of looking at physics. It opened up a new way of understanding basically uh, that, that this entanglement kind of leads to kind of po possibilities to, to, to to, to, to also states of matter to, to kind of to, to, to things that are completely impossible in classical worlds. And, uh, and you can make use of this to make new kind of information tasks. So, so anyway, uh, let me kind of very quickly go to this. This is another reason that Zeilinger got this Nobel Prize is that he kind of, of made a much more extensive experiment with three kind of photons. And for this, you don't even have, it's, it's a much more extreme form of this, of this, of this local realism. And you can make predictions that are actually much stronger. Anyway, so he observed this. Uh, and uh, and maybe I have to I will end with this uh, with this slide. I had actually quite some more slides about about applications of of, of this entanglement, but I will uh, uh, I will stop here. So so basically, what David Merman is saying: Look, you have this quantum mechanics, and it's kind of amazingly spectacular successes. Okay, so so we didn't understand anything about matter before quantum mechanics. Now we understand everything, but despite this success. Uh, we still don't understand anything about it. Okay, so the whole attitude of quantum uh, physicists is to shut up and calculate, but somehow, nevertheless, this means, well, don't ask questions. No, quantum mechanics is completely consistent, allows you to do physics, you can do great things, but don't ask too many questions about, uh, uh, about, uh, about these quantum correlations. Well, this is kind of not right. It's exactly by asking these more fundamental questions that, it, uh, that you get kind of to understand quantum systems, especially quantum many body systems, in the, from the point of view of their correlations. And by making use of that, you can have construct a completely new language for solving some of the hardest problems in physics. So, uh, so let me stop here uh, and thanks for your attention. So, thank you, Frank, for this uh, most inspiring talk. So obviously now we all understand it all 100%, right? With 100% certainty.